chemicals and reactions in the gas phase. We started this quarter by learning that matter can have several different physical states. Some of the most common physical states are solids, liquids, and gases, and more recently we've also studied aqueous solutions. This unit will be about molecules in the gas phase, or molecules that have the physical state of being a gas. What we already know about the gas phase is that molecules in it tend to have a variable shape and a variable volume. In other words, the molecules can fill whatever the shape of their container is, and they can both expand and be condensed into larger and smaller volumes. There are many different gases around you at all times. One of the most common, and one of the ones we used in several examples, is H2O in the gas phase. We usually call this water vapor, or steam. Aside from water vapor, there's many other gases that you're probably familiar with. Of course, you need oxygen gas to breathe. Oxygen gas has the chemical formula O2. It's two oxygen atoms bonded together. Another gas that you might have around you, especially if you have natural gas at home, is methane. Methane is the primary component in natural gas, and it has the chemical formula CH4, one carbon and four hydrogen atoms bonded together. Also, if you've ever had to fill balloons for a party, you're familiar with helium gas. Helium, which is a noble gas, has the chemical formula HE, because it's simply the chemical symbol for helium. Of all these four gases, probably the most important for life on Earth is oxygen, although some people would argue water is just as important. The air that you're breathing, however, is not pure oxygen. In fact, oxygen isn't even the majority of the molecules that are filling your lungs right now. Air is actually a mixture of gases. In most places on Earth, about 78% of the volume of air is actually nitrogen molecules, or nitrogen gas. It has the chemical formula N2. Only 21% of the air you're breathing is actually oxygen. The other 1%, or slightly less than 1% of the air that you're breathing, is filled with a very wide range of gases that vary depending on where you are, what the weather is, and how clean the air is. It includes things like water vapor, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and other molecules like ozone, nitrogen dioxide, and more. Even though we're exposed to a wide variety of gas molecules around us, many of these gas molecules behave in similar ways. This is covered in something called the kinetic molecular theory of gases. It's basically a theory that explains how gas molecules behave. If we were to imagine having a tank filled with gas molecules where we could actually see the molecules, we'd notice some things about the way it behaves. To begin with, in the kinetic molecular theory of gases, we assume that all gases are mostly empty space. That means if we had to draw it on paper, we draw just a few very small dots, with the container being mostly empty. The second assumption in the kinetic molecular theory of gases is that in gases, those molecules are moving and their movement is random. That means they're not attracted to each other, they're not repelled from each other, they're not attracted to the walls of the container, and gravity has no effect on them. Another assumption in the kinetic molecular theory of gases is that these gases have elastic collisions. When you hear the word elastic, you probably think about something that's bouncy or springy, and that's exactly what this means. Elastic collisions are collisions where an object bounces off of another object, and it has exactly as much energy when it bounces off as when it collided. What that means on a practical level is even though these molecules might collide with each other, they continue to bounce around. They don't run out of energy. The final assumption in the kinetic molecular theory of gases is that all gases have kinetic energy proportional to temperature. We know kinetic energy just means the energy of movement. Saying something is proportional to temperature means as temperature goes up, the kinetic energy will also go up. So what this basically means is if I double the temperature of these gas molecules, their kinetic energy should also double. Or in other words, they'll move a lot faster. These four assumptions define a perfect or an ideal gas. If a gas completes all of these assumptions, meaning it is mostly empty space, the molecules are moving truly randomly, they have elastic collisions, and they have kinetic energy proportional to temperature, 
we say that that gas sample is an ideal gas. In reality, the gas molecules around you don't perfectly fit this bill. Under some conditions, they do act like ideal gases. For instance, the oxygen in the atmosphere around us, as long as we don't condense it, bottle it, or put it into a very small container, tends to behave like an ideal gas. To keep things simple, we always assume gases act ideally unless we're dealing with a more practical application of chemistry, which usually comes at higher levels of the class. So for this unit, we'll assume that all the gases we're talking about follow ideal gas behavior, or in other words, they abide by the kinetic molecular theory of gases. Probably one of the most important concepts when talking about gases is the concept of gas pressure. Pressure the way you think about it is this sort of a pushing feeling or the fact that some things push on other things. In reality, pressure is actually caused by gas molecules colliding with things. When we think about something as simple as a tire, the gas pressure inside that tire is caused by the molecules of air inside the tire pushing out on the walls. As those gas molecules collide with the surface, they push out. And when you take that effect over the billions and billions and billions of molecules that are in even the smallest sample of gas, the result is that they push out uniformly. So pressure is actually caused by billions of little collisions with the walls of a container. There's a lot of different units or different ways to measure pressure. Those different units have arisen from different interpretations of what pressure is and different applications where pressure is important. Let's look at a few of them that you're likely to run into. One of the most important units in science and in chemistry is the unit of the atmosphere. It may sound odd to talk about the atmosphere as a unit, but it is related to the atmosphere that's around us, the sky and the air you're breathing. An atmosphere, which is abbreviated lowercase atm, is defined as the pressure of the atmosphere around us if we're at sea level on a relatively calm day. This is sort of convenient because atmospheric pressure is usually very close to one atmosphere. We'll see later on in some places around our country it's different because of things like altitude and weather. But we define atmosphere as the pressure of the atmosphere at sea level on a calm day. Because it's a little bit hard to be aware of atmospheric pressure, after all it's around you at all times, some people are more comfortable with a unit that's a little bit easier to visualize. For this reason, a lot of people have heard of pounds per square inch, or PSI. This is a unit of pressure that actually measures the force per area. You may think of it as the weight per area. Pounds per square inch is a measurement of how many pounds of pressure are pushing on every square inch of an object or surface. To put this in perspective, as you sit at sea level on a calm day, the atmosphere is pushing around you in all directions. That atmospheric pressure of one atmosphere is equivalent to 14.7 pounds per square inch. In other words, on every square inch of your body, every square inch of your skin, on your hair, your legs, your arms, everywhere, is experiencing 14.7 pounds pushing on it. We don't feel it because we're exposed to it every single day of our lives but it's definitely there. Another unit of pressure that's very closely related is the metric equivalent of pounds per square inch, which is what's called kilopascals. Again, this is a metric unit that measures the force per area. There are about 101.3 kilopascals, or kPa, in one atmosphere, or 14.7 pounds per square inch. You'll run into kilopascals if you're working in any type of scientific or engineering field. Finally, let me show you one unit of pressure that's actually very common in the medical field. The unit is millimeters of mercury. It's truly one of the more odd sounding units you'll run into because millimeters, of course, is a way of measuring length or distance, and mercury is a chemical element on the periodic table. Millimeters of mercury, which is abbreviated MM for millimeters and HG for mercury, is actually one of the oldest ways that scientists have been able to measure pressure. It's based on the height of mercury in something called a barometer.
sometimes also referred to as a manometer. We have an actual mercury barometer in our laboratory, which I'll show you next time we get together for lab. But it's basically a way of measuring how much the atmosphere, or any other substance, pushes on the mercury, causing it to rise up in a tube. If you've ever worked in a healthcare setting, you may have seen nurses or healthcare professionals measuring blood pressure using a wall-mounted barometer or manometer. This particular device uses the same concept, and in fact, millimeters of mercury is the unit of pressure that's used most commonly when measuring blood pressure. So when someone talks about having a blood pressure of 100 over 70, it's actually 100 millimeters of mercury over 70 millimeters of mercury. There's about 760 millimeters of mercury in one atmosphere. Also, sometimes in American weather forecasts, we use inches of mercury. So keep in mind that you're likely to run into other units of length in terms of millimeters, inches, or even centimeters of mercury. While it is possible to deal with pure samples of gas, in fact, they can be purchased from many chemical and medical supply companies, many times in real life we find ourselves dealing with mixtures of gases. When we deal with a mixture of different gases together, each one of the gases that's present is responsible for exerting its own pressure on the container or whatever environment we're working in. When multiple gases are present, each exerts part of the total pressure, or what we call the partial pressure. Again, this happens anytime you have a mixture, whether it's a mixture within a container, or whether we're talking about the atmosphere. We already know that the atmosphere contains a mixture of gases, 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and less than 1% of molecules such as water vapor, carbon dioxide, argon gas, and others. Each one of these gases exerts part of the total pressure. So if we're at sea level on a calm day, where the atmospheric pressure might be 14.7 psi, 78% of that value comes from the nitrogen gas. The reason this is important is that in many biological contexts, one gas might be more important than the other. As you can imagine, the pressure of oxygen gas is very important for aerobic living beings like ourselves. This is why sometimes we have to calculate the partial pressure, which is really just a way of calculating what percent of the total pressure comes from a gas. For example, in Spokane, let's say that you measure the pressure of the atmosphere and determine that it's 712 millimeters of mercury. I'm using a very common shorthand technique here, using a capital P for pressure and a small subscript ATM to mean the pressure of the atmosphere. If the pressure in the atmosphere in Spokane is 712 millimeters of mercury, what is the partial pressure of the oxygen? To solve this question, we simply have to calculate the percent of 712 millimeters of mercury. In other words, what percent of my total pressure will tell me the partial pressure of that particular gas, whatever I'm particularly looking at. In this case, we know that oxygen makes up 21% of my total pressure. And I'm saying the atmospheric pressure in Spokane, in this case, is 712 millimeters of mercury. When we say the word of in a sentence, mathematically, that means we're multiplying. So here we're really taking 21% of 712 millimeters of mercury. Depending on your calculator and how comfortable you are with percents, you might have a percent sign that you can actually push as a button, or you might have to change this into the mathematical equivalent, which is 0.21. Either way, your answer is 0.21, or 21 percent, of 712 millimeters of mercury, which gives me approximately 150 millimeters of mercury. That would be the partial pressure. This explains a little bit of some biological mechanisms you'll learn more about, especially if you go into something like respiratory science. In fact, the percent of oxygen isn't as important as the partial pressure of oxygen when it comes to how well human beings can breathe. It's a little more complex than that, so we won't go into it. But the partial pressure of oxygen, 150 millimeters of mercury in this case, is important for how people breathe. 
When we're talking about gas molecules, we understand that that's just a physical state, and it's a physical state that has much more energy than the solid or liquid physical state. We usually associate that with higher temperatures. So we know that in order for a substance to be a gas, we have to boil it. We have to add a considerable amount of energy to it. Let's consider a substance that's at that temperature above its boiling point. Above a boiling point of a substance, we expect to find molecules that are entirely in the gas state. And that's really what we've been looking at. So gas molecules have a lot of energy, and we say that they're above the boiling point of that substance, meaning they've changed into a gas from a liquid. If we were to cool that substance down, we could cool it to the point where we reach the boiling point, or in other words, the temperature where it should boil. At that point, we expect to have a mixture of two different physical states. One is the gas molecules that still remain, but the second is the liquid molecules. And you can think about this in terms of boiling a pot of water on the stove. You have both liquid molecules present and gas molecules present. If I cool the substance down even further, I expect the amount of gas to decrease and the amount of liquid to increase. In other words, I expect all those gas molecules to turn into liquid molecules. However, something interesting happens here. When we go below the boiling temperature, or in other words, below the boiling point of that substance, we will have mostly liquid molecules. That's what the majority of the substance will be. But we'll also have some amount of molecules that can remain in the gas form. These molecules are not technically at a high enough temperature to be a gas, but they've temporarily got enough kinetic energy to escape the liquid that they were part of. Because they're kind of renegade molecules, they've escaped the liquid even though they weren't supposed to. Instead of referring to them as gas, we usually use the term vapor. Vapor is simply gas molecules that form above a liquid, and they tend to form at a temperature where the majority of the molecules are still going to remain as a liquid. This is what we call vapor, and vapor molecules, just like any other gas molecule, can still collide with the walls of the container. They can still create pressure, and instead of calling it gas pressure, we'll call it vapor pressure. When scientists talk about vapor pressure, what they're talking about are molecules that are above a liquid. And one of the ways it's commonly used is to talk about how easily a substance can evaporate. If you have a high vapor pressure in a substance, it means a lot of molecules can escape that liquid into the gas form, even if it doesn't reach its boiling point. So vapor pressure is often, to describe, often used to describe sus substances that easily turn into gases. These are substances like gasoline. Gasoline has a high vapor pressure, and that's why it's dangerous to use any flame near liquid gasoline. We understand that there are vapor molecules above the liquid that could still ignite and create a problem. One of the things about vapor pressure is it's very closely related to the temperature of the substance. You'll notice that what we've really done as we increase the temperature of a substance from below the boiling point to the boiling point, we're really just increasing the number of molecules that are turning into a gas. So while we have just a few vapor molecules over a liquid, the closer that liquid gets to boiling, the more and more vapor molecules we get. And in that point, eventually we just have gas molecules. So we can say that temperature and vapor pressure, or PVAP for short, are directly proportional. As the temperature goes up, the vapor pressure goes up. Another way to say that is as the temperature is increased, you'll get more and more molecules turning into vapor. Now that we understand that as temperature goes up, vapor pressure goes up, let's look in a little more detail at this transition from liquids to vapors and gases. One of the most fundamental parts of this is acknowledging that for any substance, there is this thing called a boiling point. So for water, we're pretty comfortable picturing water as it changes from liquid water into steam. But that idea of changing from the liquid state to the gaseous state exists for all different substances. All substances change from liquid to gas at what we call the boiling point. 
and it's just another phrase for boiling temperature. It's usually abbreviated BP, and it just means the temperature where your liquid turns entirely into gas. So remember, there's still vapor over the liquid at all times, but when we reach the boiling point, that's where all of the molecules begin to attain the energy they need in order to turn into a gas. The boiling point for each substance is fairly individual and unique to that substance. So some substances you're comfortable thinking about the boiling point of. Right away, water comes to mind. When you think about H2O, we usually think about it as liquid water because that's how it exists at room temperature. We also know that if we heat the liquid H2O to a temperature of 100 degrees Celsius or 212 Fahrenheit, it will boil. It will start to change into a gas. But that boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius is specific to the H2O molecule. Different molecules with different chemical formulas and different structures have their own boiling points. For example, oxygen, O2, we usually think of as being a gas. But just like any other substance, oxygen can be a solid, a liquid, or a gas depending on the temperature. The reason we think of oxygen in the gas form is because that's the temperature it exists at room temperature. And that's because the boiling point or the boiling temperature of oxygen is negative 183 degrees Celsius. In other words, 297 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. That means that at that incredibly cold temperature, the oxygen has enough energy to boil or turn into a gas. And if you wanted to condense the oxygen into the liquid form, you would have to bring the substance down to 183 degrees Celsius below zero. Other substances have very high boiling points. Sodium chloride or table salt, for instance, we think of as a solid at room temperature. You have to take it over a thousand degrees Fahrenheit just to get it to melt into a liquid. And to get it to boil, you have to raise it to about 2,575 degrees Fahrenheit. That's an incredibly hot temperature. So all different substances have their own boiling point. And what determines that boiling point for any substance? Well, there's two main factors. The first factor, and the first one we'll look at, is the atmospheric pressure that surrounds that substance. The second factor is really the substance itself. The molecular structure in a substance probably has the most to do with why H2O boils at 100 degrees Celsius, but oxygen boils at 183 below zero Celsius. Let's look first at the atmospheric pressure and then look at intermolecular forces, or in other words, the molecular structure of the substance. Atmospheric pressure affects the boiling point of all different substances because as long as we're imagining substances on Earth, we know that those substances exist in the atmospheric gases that we're breathing in right now. That atmospheric pressure has an effect on boiling point because it interacts with the molecules in every substance. Let's start with an example of just a simple droplet of H2O. In this H2O, we would expect to have millions of molecules of water, but assuming the droplet is suspended in midair, the reason it forms that nice round shape is because there is atmospheric pressure that's pushing on it from all different angles. So from the top, the bottom, and all around this water droplet, there's atmospheric pressure. And you can think of this as a pressure that pushes in on those molecules and helps it stay in a droplet form. Of course, there's other forces going on here, but that atmospheric pressure is always present. At the same time, there's another pressure going on in this droplet, and that is the vapor pressure of the H2O. We know that even though this is a droplet of liquid water, there is enough energy for some amount of molecules to escape into the gas or the vapor phase. And we know that the warmer this droplet got, the more vapor pressure there is. So you can think of the vapor pressure as an outward force. This is the liquid molecules attempting to turn into a gas. And a lot of students have an easy time remembering this as it's like a fight between the atmospheric pressure pushing on the droplet and the vapor pressure pushing out of the droplet. Now, as we saw earlier, vapor pressure is related to temperature. 
So if we start to increase the temperature on this droplet of water to take it from maybe a cool room temperature to something higher, we're going to see the vapor pressure of the molecule start to increase. So as I start to heat this droplet of H2O and make it warmer and warmer, I don't have the same outward forces of vapor pressure. I now have larger outward forces of vapor pressure. And at the same time, I still have the exact same atmospheric pressure. At some point, the vapor pressure can get large enough, as long as we increase the temperature high enough, that it can match or overcome that atmospheric pressure. It's like finally the vapor pressure it can win the war against the atmospheric pressure, or it can win the fight against that inward pushing pressure. And that's actually the temperature where those molecules are no longer constrained to stay in a liquid form. They now have enough energy to escape the atmospheric pressure and turn into a gas. So whether we're talking about H2O or any other substance, the, defi the definition of when something will boil or the boiling point or boiling temperature of that substance is that it's simply the temperature when the vapor pressure matches and then overcomes the atmospheric pressure. Or in other words, when PVAP is equal to P atmosphere. So by increasing the temperature, we increase the vapor pressure and that fights back against the atmospheric pressure until the two are matched. This is true for all substances, no matter where they are, and we can change the vapor pressure by changing the temperature, but the atmospheric pressure can also change. Atmospheric pressure actually changes in any location from day to day based on the weather, but it's really small changes that don't tend to affect boiling point. What does tend to affect boiling point is when the atmospheric pressure is significantly different because of altitude. So if you think about yourself standing in the atmosphere, there's a certain amount of atmospheric pressure pushing down on you at every moment. And really it's pushing at you from all angles, but we tend to think about the atmosphere being above us, so we'll just represent it as pushing down on ourselves. If you're to go to a higher altitude, maybe because you go up into the mountains, at that point you'd be higher up in the atmosphere. In other words, there's less atmosphere above you. And because of that, there's less atmospheric pressure. The result of this is that at higher altitudes, you have less atmospheric pressure pushing in on that droplet, or less atmospheric pressure pushing on every substance. And because of that, you don't need as much vapor pressure to fight back with. So at higher altitudes, you don't have to heat the substance as high because you don't need as high a vapor pressure to turn those molecules into a gas. The result is at higher altitudes, we have lower boiling points, and that's true for any substance. So water boils at slightly lower temperatures when you go up in altitude. If you go from Spokane to a higher altitude city like Denver, there is several degrees difference between the boiling point of water in Spokane and the boiling point of water in Denver. If you go to an extremely high altitude, like the top of Mount Everest, that difference gets even more dramatic. In fact, on top of Mount Everest, depending on exactly what the weather's like, water boils at about 156 degrees Fahrenheit. Rather than the 212 degrees Fahrenheit, it boils at at sea level. So this is an effect that we see even when you flip over containers in the grocery store and you see high altitude cooking directions. Those are an adjustment because as the water boils in the food, it's boiling at a lower temperature, and thus you're actually cooking your food at a lower temperature. So you often have to cook things longer at higher altitudes. This is one of the impacts on boiling point that we can really see, and this is because of atmospheric pressure. But atmospheric pressure is only one of the factors that influences the boiling point of a molecule. In fact, the largest factor is the molecule itself. When we look at boiling points, the molecular structure of a substance really has the largest effect. So if we were to zoom in on a container of liquid and examine the molecules in that liquid, we can represent them as just some little dots. But the reason that those dots are staying close together to each other in liquid form, rather than becoming a gas, 
is really because they have to overcome their attractions to each other. In between each molecule in a liquid, there is a type of attraction that keeps those molecules relatively close together. You can think about this as a string that ties the molecules together or a glue. It's not a physical substance. It's not the same as a shared covalent bond. It's more like an attraction that you might experience between two different magnets. They're attracted to each other even though there's no real connection between them. And the same thing happens in all substances in their liquid state. There's some amount of attraction between the different molecules. Because it's between different molecules, we call these intermolecular attractions. Inter means between, so this means between different molecules. They're called intermolecular attractions, or very commonly just intermolecular forces. The stronger these intermolecular forces, the more ways these molecules are attracted to each other. It's like having even more glue holding that liquid together. And the more attraction, the more glue, the more that liquid wants to stay together, the less likely it is to turn into a gas. And if you wanted to turn it into a gas, you would have to heat it to a higher temperature, put more energy in to break those attractions. So the stronger the intermolecular forces, the higher the boiling point of a substance. What are these intermolecular forces? Well, there's a variety of them, and they can have different names, and we can subdivide them in different ways, but we're just going to focus on three basic intermolecular forces. Again, three types of glue, so to speak, that hold liquid molecules together in a substance. Of these three intermolecular forces, let's start out with the weakest. The weakest intermolecular force is called the London dispersion force, and it's sometimes also called the van der Waals force. Van der Waals, or London dispersion, whichever you call it, really is the result of temporary dipoles that occur in molecules. We learned that dipole is just a word that means two poles, or in other words, polar molecule. This, in this case, is a temporary dipole. So it exists in molecules that don't have a permanent dipole. If we take a nonpolar molecule like propane, propane, like all hydrocarbons, is a nonpolar molecule because it consists only of carbon-carbon single bonds and carbon-hydrogen single bonds, all of which are nonpolar. What that means is that at any one time, the electrons in that molecule are really loosely located throughout the molecule. They're equally likely to be in any location, maybe around the bonds, maybe on the left side, maybe on the right side, but they don't spend more time closer to one atom or one side of the molecule at least not all the time. But because electrons, as we've learned earlier, are moving very, very quickly at all times, they can temporarily bunch up in one area of the molecule. So while this is a nonpolar molecule that does not have a dipole, we couldn't draw a vector arrow for it, it's totally possible, and in fact likely, that for just a millisecond at a time, those electrons end up on one side of the molecule more than the other. So for a temporary moment, we have a negative and a positive side to the molecule. It's like a temporarily polar molecule. And like polar molecules with negative and positive sides, or like magnets with north sides and south sides, that means this molecule can now attract other molecules that have a polar, or pardon me, a negative and a positive side. So just temporarily, the picture we're looking at could only exist for a milli or even a microsecond. There is an attraction that will occur between the negative side of the molecule and the positive side of the molecule and vice versa. That attraction is just enough to bring these liquid molecules close together. This type of force, because it's temporary, really occurs in all molecules, because all molecules have electrons that are constantly moving around. Because it is so weak, we really only worry about it in molecules that don't have any other significant intermolecular forces. And that specifically is nonpolar molecules. Because nonpolar molecules don't have a permanent dipole, and therefore aren't going to have 
permanent attractions to other molecules, these temporary attractions become important. So important, in fact, that the molecule that we think of as Teflon really is a molecule that overcomes these temporary dipoles so that nothing will be attracted to it. So all molecules have London dispersion forces, although we tend to only be concerned with it in nonpolar molecules. Of the three intermolecular forces, the next strongest, and it is much stronger, is something called dipole-dipole forces, or dipole-dipole interactions. And this is really the permanent version of what we just looked at. Dipole-dipole attractions are simply the attractions that occur between permanent dipoles. So if we have a polar molecule with a positive and a negative end, we've already learned that we can draw a vector arrow through that molecule, which represents where the positive side is and where the negative side is. When two polar molecules come into close contact with each other, the positives and negatives attract. So we end up with an attraction between the positive side and the other negative side of the other molecule. Notice this is an intermolecular force. It's an attraction between two separate molecules. And it, because this is an attraction between dipoles, it can only occur in molecules that have a dipole. In other words, it only occurs in polar molecules. So while London dispersion forces occur in all molecules, the much stronger attraction of dipole-dipole interactions only occur in polar molecules. The strongest of our three intermolecular forces is something called hydrogen bonding. And it's difficult to remember sometimes that this is still referring to an intermolecular force. So this is not referring to hydrogen in a covalent bond. It's an intermolecular force between two different molecules. So just having a hydrogen with bonds in a molecule doesn't mean it will do the intermolecular force known as hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding, or H bonding for short, is really just an especially strong version of dipole-dipole interactions. Hydrogen bonding occurs when you have an attraction not just between positive and negative sides of two different molecules, but when you have a really positive and a really negative side. That really negative side tends to be an electron pair, in other words, a lone pair, that's on a nitrogen atom, an oxygen atom, or a fluorine atom. The reason being, these are some of the most electronegative elements on the periodic table. They're small, and they're very likely to have electron pairs in a molecular structure. So they're very, very negative, usually, in the molecules in which we find their structures. The hydrogen is the positive part. And the reason the hydrogen is especially positive is it, in turn, is bonded to an N, O, or F. So it's part of a covalent bond where it's much more positive than the very electronegative N, O, or F atoms. We see this all the time occurring because one of the most common molecules that has hydrogen bonding interactions is the water molecule. The water molecule can hydrogen bond, or in other words, it can interact with other water molecules in a couple different ways. In the simplest way, of course, like all molecules, it has London dispersion attractions because those electrons are always moving around the molecule. The stronger attraction it has than London dispersion is that it's a polar molecule. So it has a dipole arrow, so I could line it up with other molecules that have dipole arrows, including other water molecules, and we would have dipole-dipole attractions. But water can also do hydrogen bonding because it has a hydrogen bonded to an oxygen that meets one of our criteria, and it also has an electron pair that's bonded to the oxygen. So when you put two water molecules close together, the very positive hydrogen on one of the molecules is attracted to those negative electron pairs on the other molecules. And as you notice, because there's more than one electron pair, each water molecule can form more than one hydrogen bond. In fact, this is at the root of why water freezes in crystalline structures. It has to do with the patterns of the hydrogen bonding.
but we're not going to get into that right now. For now, it's just important to remember that two molecules can form a hydrogen bonding interaction as long as one has a hydrogen bonded to an NO or F and the other has an electron pair on an NO or F. If one molecule only fits one of these descriptions, we would say that it can't hydrogen bond with itself, meaning a pure substance wouldn't have hydrogen bonds between those molecules, but it can still interact with a hydrogen bond with another molecule. And again, that's very important when it comes to substances mixing together, but in pure substances, we'll just look for molecules that fit both of these descriptions. Now that we've seen the three primary intermolecular forces, the only three that we're going to look at in this class, let's practice actually using this and then extrapolating information about boiling point from our conclusions. In order to practice this, I'm going to show you three different physical structures and I want you to go ahead and look at them one by one and name the intermolecular forces that will exist in a pure sample of each of those substances. So for each one, remember that that really means we need to figure out first if it's nonpolar or polar and second, does it have those two criteria that it could form hydrogen bonds with other identical molecules. So you've got three opportunities to practice here. Once you have those three, and you're welcome to pause the video or restart it as many times as you want as you work through them. Then we'll look at how those intermolecular forces affect boiling point. Because more or stronger intermolecular forces increase the boiling point of a substance, we should be able to figure out, based on which intermolecular forces are present, which of those substances would have the highest and the lowest boiling points. Here are the three structures that I'm giving you. Go ahead and pause the video and work through them one by one. First figure out if they're polar or nonpolar and decide which intermolecular forces will affect them based on that, but don't forget to also consider whether or not they can hydrogen bond. Pause the video now. Okay, so let's start on these top molecule first and then I'll give you another opportunity to pause the video in case you got stuck. In this molecule, I have a carbon double bonded to an oxygen and single bonded to what we call methyl groups. In other words, carbon with three hydrogens. Because carbon and hydrogen bonds are nonpolar, it's not uncommon to see these methyl groups, because they're derived from methane, as written together in this condensed form. This shouldn't worry you because that CH3 or H3C, depending on which side we look at, really is just a nonpolar part of the molecule, so it's not that important for us in figuring out if there is a dipole present. When I look at this molecule as a whole, the CH3 part is nonpolar, but I also have to consider the other bonds. The carbon carbon bonds, of course, are nonpolar, but the carbon oxygen bond is polar. I know that because if I looked at my electronegativity chart, I could look up the fact that the oxygen is much more electronegative than the carbon. Carbon is about a 2.5, while oxygen is around a 3.5. So if I wanted to, I could even indicate that the oxygen is the negative side of the molecule and the negative side of that bond, while carbon is the positive side. And because that's really the only negatives and positives I'm going to have to write in the whole molecule, the rest of it is nonpolar, that gives me a vector arrow that points towards the oxygen. In other words, my conclusion is that this particular molecule is polar. Because it's polar, I can conclude that it would definitely have London dispersion, because all molecules have London dispersion forces, but in addition, it would also have dipole-dipole interactions. And those dipole-dipole interactions, or dipole-dipole forces, are much stronger than London dispersion. So they're important. Now that I know that, let's look at the same molecule and see if it would hydrogen bond. In order to hydrogen bond, I have to have hydrogen bonded to an N, an O, or an F. And then I can look for electron pairs. However, when I look at this molecule, I do see hydrogen. I see three hydrogen here and three hydrogen there, but those hydrogen are bonded to carbon. That's not N, O, or F. 
So while this molecule will have London dispersion forces, like all molecules, and it will have dipole-dipole because it's polar, it will not hydrogen bond. So the strongest intermolecular force for this molecule is dipole-dipole. Now that you've seen that, if you didn't already do the next two, go ahead and give them a try. The second molecule is CH4, or carbon with four hydrogens around it. You might have recognized this one right away from lab. Because this molecule consists entirely of carbon-hydrogen bonds, and those bonds are nonpolar, I can already conclude that this entire molecule is nonpolar. And because it's nonpolar, I know that it won't have dipole-dipole forces, but like all molecules, it'll still have London dispersion. I can always consider, too, will it hydrogen bond? You're very unlikely to see hydrogen bonding molecules that are nonpolar, although never say never. But when I look at the hydrogens, again, the hydrogen atoms in this molecule are bonded to a carbon atom, and that's not N, O, or F. So there won't be hydrogen bonding. And the strongest intermolecular force, then, in this molecule is the only intermolecular force. It's London dispersion forces. Again, feel free to pause the video if you didn't try the next molecule already. All right, my final and third molecule, I now need to evaluate to see if it's polar or nonpolar. Again, we see several condensed pieces of the structure, CH3, CH2, and we know that we can just ignore those because carbon-hydrogen bonds are nonpolar, so they're not going to give us any real useful information about the compound. Beyond that, I really have bonds between carbons, and then I obviously can see that there's a bond between oxygen and hydrogen. If this is confusing to you, you might think of the structure this way. It's really carbon bonded to carbon, bonded to oxygen, bonded to hydrogen, with all those hydrogens sticking off the sides. So the left side of the molecule, so to speak, is nonpolar, but on the right side, I can definitely see that there's a very electronegative element in that oxygen. How you draw the vector arrow is up to you. If you feel more comfortable starting with our small Greek symbols for deltas, we could say that this part will be negative, this part will be positive, while this part will be positive. That means my vector arrow would do something like that. It's a little difficult to see on this one, but it's okay, because as long as you had that gut instinct that this molecule is polar, you'll end up drawing the right conclusions. So, because it's a molecule, it has to have London dispersion. Because it's a polar molecule, it also is going to have dipole-dipole forces. Now I have to figure out if this molecule will have hydrogen bonding. So I'm going to look for a hydrogen that's bonded to an N, an O, or an F. And right away you'll see that I do have a hydrogen atom, and it is bonded to an oxygen. In order for this molecule to hydrogen bond with another identical molecule, I have to make sure that I also have electron pairs on an N, O, or F. And it's totally okay that they're on the same oxygen. That means if I have two of these molecules next to each other, the hydrogen provides the positive part of the hydrogen bonding interaction, while the electron pair on the other molecule will create the negative part of that hydrogen bonding interaction. Because I have a hydrogen bonded to an N, O, or F, and that O has electron pairs on it, I can conclude that this molecule will be able to interact through hydrogen bonding. And hydrogen bonding is our strongest intermolecular force by far. Now that I have that information, I can draw my conclusions about boiling points. If you haven't done that already, feel free to pause the video. Which of these molecules do you think is going to have the highest boiling point? Well, the answer is whichever molecule has the strongest intermolecular forces will have the highest boiling point. As I look at the conclusions I've already drawn, I can see that my final molecule, my third molecule down here, has the hydrogen bonding, which is the strongest force. So therefore, this molecule will have the highest boiling point. And believe it or not, because it's got the highest boiling point, the highest boiling point means the most intermolecular attractions. In other words, the most glue holding that molecule as a liquid. 
that means that it'll also have the lowest vapor pressure because vapor pressure, or PVAP, is a measurement of how easily molecules turn into vapor. If there's a lot of intermolecular forces holding these molecules together, then it's very unlikely they're going to turn into a vapor. So my molecule that has the strongest intermolecular forces always has the highest boiling point and the lowest vapor pressure. The reverse can be said for the molecule with the lowest boiling point. The lowest boiling point will have the least or the weakest intermolecular forces. I have one molecule on this page that only has London dispersion interactions. That molecule, the methane molecule that we saw in lab, will have the lowest boiling point, lowest BP. And for that matter, it'll also have the highest vapor pressure. The molecule in the middle, which in this case is the molecule on the top of the page, has London dispersion and dipole-dipole interactions, but no hydrogen bonding, so it would be somewhere in the middle. Now, why did I choose these three different molecules? Well, the reason is these are molecules that actually give a really good physical demonstration of how boiling point analysis works. In other words, how we just figured out what we did. These molecules, the one on the top of the page, is actually acetone. You may be familiar with acetone because it's often used as nail polish remover or paint thinner or a cleaning agent. If you've ever left a container of acetone sitting out, you know it evaporates really quickly. That's because it doesn't have hydrogen bonding, but it does have dipole-dipole forces. In other words, it is a liquid at room temperature, but it's just about ready to turn into a gas because it doesn't have very strong intermolecular forces between the molecules. The molecule in the middle, as we said, is methane, which we think of as methane gas or natural gas. Methane gas is a gas at room temperature because it has so few intermolecular forces that just room temperature is enough heat to boil it off. In fact, the boiling point of methane is 162 degrees below zero Celsius. So when we compare that to something like water, which is at 100 degrees above zero Celsius, methane, 162 degrees Celsius below zero, or in other words, about negative 259 degrees Fahrenheit, has such an incredibly low boiling point because it has so few intermolecular attractions. In other words, the molecules are not that attracted to each other, so it's very easy to heat them to the point where they can overcome the intermolecular attractions and turn into a gas. Acetone, on the other hand, has a boiling point of about 56 degrees Celsius. That's about 134 degrees Fahrenheit. So acetone would completely boil if we heated it to just 134 degrees. That's why it evaporates so much more easily than water molecules. The molecule at the bottom of the page, which we determined to have the highest boiling point, is actually ethanol. In other words, it's alcohol, drinking alcohol. It's also used as an alternative fuel source. And it's not the same as rubbing alcohol, isopropyl alcohol, but it's very closely related. Ethanol has a boiling point of about 78.4 degrees Celsius. This is why you may have heard that wine or beer's alcohol will boil off in a cooking process. That's somewhat true because 78 degrees Celsius is about 173 degrees Fahrenheit. So just by heating your pan to 173 degrees Fahrenheit, you can overcome the intermolecular attractions of ethanol and cause it to turn into a vapor or turn into a gas. It's not quite as strong as the intermolecular attractions between water molecules because water boils at a higher temperature than that. So we can see that just by looking at structure and determining intermolecular forces based on the structure, we can actually figure out why molecules behave the way they do, even in our day-to-day -day lives.